Good morning. Hey, what a joy and honor it is for me to be here uh, with each and every one of you today. Um, like uh, Jeff said, I've got a chance to uh, connect with him uh, a little while ago. And man, what a firecracker of a man he is. Am I right or what, right? Um, you can tell he exudes the joy and the presence of Jesus. Um, I mean, it, it's just in our conversations, which is so great. And I knew right then and there, like, I was really looking forward to being here with you and meeting each and every one of you. Um, I know God has a word for you. And, um, and as I've been praying for uh, just our moment here t- together today, um, I know one of the things that um, I was actually going in one direction after talking with Jeff. And I really felt like the Lord also just bringing back something um, in my heart uh, over you. And so I'm going to be sharing a little bit about that. But um, before we go on, uh, just a little bit about myself. I know you're like, okay, who is this stranger? Who is this person that just popped up and he's talking to us now? Uh, my name is David, um, and like um, Jeff said, I'm, over, uh, I'm the pastor of multiplication over at North Shore Church. Uh, but joke's on them because I'm allergic to math, <laughs> uh, which is what I told uh, my parents, and I never flew. But um, Basically, um, people ask, hey, so what is that? What do you do with that? And so basically, um, North Shore is a single-site church, and something that we have been praying for over the past few years is um, um, North Shore has, uh, has a history of planning churches, and now we're just uh, seeking God in direction of how we can multiply that effort, uh, especially coming out of COVID and, and whatnot. And so um, that's what I get to do at the church. Um, I have a family of five um, my wife, uh, Lydia, uh, and I, we've been married for 20 years, uh, literally like two, two weeks ago. And so we had a chance to celebrate our 20th anniversary. And um, we have three kids, um, two daughters uh, that are 18 and 16 years old, and one son who is uh, 10 years old. And uh, people are like, oh, wow, why'd you wait so long to have your third? I was like, like what do you mean? And I like, wait, I wasn't waiting for anything. They're like, were you like trying for a boy? I was like, no, I wasn't trying for anything. I was trying for the light at the end of the tunnel, right? Um, and uh, yeah, it turns out, um, you know, he was a surprise baby. And uh, we all know how that works, so we don't need to get into details. Um, but he has been, our family has been such a great joy uh, for me. Um, and just al- always been a grounding source uh, for me. Uh, always uh, humbling me in, in, in good ways. Uh, to be reminded that I need Jesus every single day, every single moment of my life. And so I do have that first one going off to college, and um, I don't know how to feel about that. You know, I'm feeling, holding my emotions a little bit kind of tenderly these days, uh, but that's about to happen as she goes to school in California. Um, I've also been in ministry, full-time ministry, for 20 years now, and um, all of up and down the West Coast from Southern California all the way up to Vancouver, British Columbia, and a couple cities in between there. Um, and it's been such a great joy. I love being in ministry because I really love being able to meet people like you. Um, I had a chance to meet a couple of you, a handful of you this morning, and uh, such a wonderful group of people here. Um, so dedicated. I can totally see that. Um, but one of my favorite things of being in ministry is uh, really seeing the transformation that takes place in a person's life when they experience the freedom of Christ. Man, there's just really nothing like that. Because when Jesus enters a person's life and they experience freedom for the first time, they completely become a brand new person. And that's what I wanted to talk about today, finding freedom. Because truth of the matter is, whether we've been a follower of Jesus for decades, or we might not even have a relationship with Jesus, we often find ourselves enslaved to something or trapped, entrapped by something that, that keeps us from really becoming the people that God had designed us to be. And if we're completely honest with ourselves, we all have one or two or a few things that I'm sure that we would want to be free from. So freedom is something that we all want. Freedom is something that every single one of us in this room pursue because there's always something uh, that's behind us, that's keeping us from being that person that we want to be, that we know that God designed us to be. Um, And as as we're thinking about freedom, I mean, freedom comes in so many different ways. I remember, um, for me, growing up, freedom was literally... When I graduated high school, I was going off to college. That, for me, was freedom. Uh, I grew up in the D.C. area where, um, with 
a pair of really strict uh, first-generation Korean parents who were immigrants here. And so obviously, um, you know, they really wanted me to study and do well with academics. And so they had put a lot of pressure on me. They also happened to be pastors, uh, which basically meant I couldn't sin. Um, and so that was my upbringing. And so the idea of going away for college wasn't, honestly, it wasn't even for education, it was for freedom. I was like, I'm ready to get out of here. I'm ready to experience freedom away from my strict immigrant parents. Um, and so, and you're, you're thinking, like, how bad could it have been? Like, here it is. I'll, I'll give you a couple examples. Okay, so when kids look forward to summer, right, and like, can't wait to be done with school. Summer is going to be looking, summer is amazing. We love summer. We get to go to the pool and all that. I didn't like looking forward to summer because I knew what this meant. The moment school ends is the moment my dad will take me to the library Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And for 30 hours, I was sitting in the library. And mind you, remember, we didn't have, like, laptops, iPads, or cell phones. Back then, it was none of those things. I literally sat in front of a book in the library all summer long. I know, right? Harsh. And you're wondering, okay, what did you do for 30 hours a week in the library? I'll tell you what I did. While my friends were playing video games, playing in the pool, riding their bikes around the neighborhood, I was, get this, I was reading the dictionary. Yeah, I know. A thriller of a book if you haven't read that yet. Um, and I literally had to read it cover to cover. And so if you were to ask me what any word meant, I will happily tell you what it means because it's in the dictionary, and you can find it there. Um, but so for me, like just looking forward to freedom and going to college was really something that I looked forward to. Um, and I know that my idea of freedom was being able to do anything I wanted to do. That's what I wanted, that's what I wanted going away to college, because I no longer had my strict parents with me. Now, they've loosened up a lot, because now they're just like, you know, whenever I'm doing the same things to my kids, they're like, you're kind of harsh to your kids. I'm like, where were you like 30, 40 years ago, right? Um, well, um, in a way, me pursuing freedom kind of reminded me a little bit about the people of Israel, Seeking freedom, because there was a period in time where they were uh, enslaved to Pharaoh and the Egyptians, making bricks and making, I mean, it was just harsh, harsh life for them. And so, for me, it just reminded a little bit about them escaping Egypt, because they were no longer under the rule of Pharaoh. They had all the freedom that they wanted, and so what they did was, as they left as they left uh, Pharaoh and Egypt, and they were wandering the desert. They could do really, literally anything they wanted. And they actually took that to another level. Because what ended up happening is, obviously, there's a lot of, lot of things that happened in those 40 years as they were wandering the desert. But one of the things that they did was, um, as their leader Moses was up at Mount Sinai having a meeting with God, the people of Israel were waiting for Moses to get back. He wasn't coming back anytime soon, so they were just getting bored. They were just like, okay, what are we going to do? We need to figure out something. Just, there's absolutely nothing. We're getting bored. And so they convinced Aaron, one of the priests, to build a golden calf. They thought, you know what? Let's do this. We need something to do. And so uh, they build a golden calf. Moses eventually comes down with the Ten Commandments. Obviously, he is angry. He throws the tablets because of what he is seeing. It's just blasphemous to God. And you can tell this totally breaks the heart of God. And God is actually enraged at what he is seeing. And this is how he responds. Of course, there's a lot of things that happen. But uh, we're going to just get right to Exodus chapter 33. And we're going to be there uh, today. Um, Exodus 33, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses... Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. But listen to what he says here. But I will not go with you. Because you are a stiff-necked people, 
and I might destroy you on the way. It kind of sounds a little bit like what I would say to my kids on a long road trip. Um, but here, I want us to understand the gravity of this moment right now. Because God is saying, sure, you know what? I'm going to keep my deal, my end of the promise. Right? I'm going to keep my promise to, that I made with your forefathers. In fact, I'll clear all the obstacles so that you can be on your way to the land flowing with milk and honey to the promised land. But here's the thing. Things have changed now because of what you have done. Because you are so stubborn, I'm not going with you. After all that God had led them through up to this point, and if, if you know what happened with the whole exodus of leaving Egypt, I mean, it was just one miracle after another after another. I mean, there is no way you could have experienced this and not believe in the power of God. I mean, these people witnessed the ultimate power of God, and yet they had turned away. And after all that God had led them through, he tells them, I'm no longer with you. This is a real pivotal moment for the, for the people of Israel. And so this is how Moses later, um, in verse 15, if you'll jump down there, verse 15, he says, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all other people on the face of the earth? So here's what Moses is saying. Your presence is the very thing that gives us distinction and identity. Without your presence, we're nothing. And so God responds to this rebellious act. Um, it was a deal breaker for him. In fact, it's interesting to know, um, this is why it was a deal breaker. Because um, the most repeated commandment of the Old Testament laws was that you shall have no other gods before me. That's also the first commandment of the Ten Commandments. And throughout all the uh, Old Testament, I mean, you, you see this repeated over and over, have no other gods before me, or, have, or, or something like that, to, something to that effect, having no other gods before him. And this was a direct violation of that very command that was the most important command. And to take it even further, the most repeated promise throughout the entire Bible, not just the Old Testament, but even the New Testament, is that I am with you. Is God's promise that I am with you. And so, these two things, um, the command and the promise, go hand in hand. So you have no other gods, and I'm with you. Keep me in the center of your life, and you will feel my presence with you. But the moment we clutter our lives with other things is the moment that we'll feel that God is distant, is a moment that we'll feel that it is very difficult to experience God's presence in our lives. And isn't that so true of our lives as well, right? The moment that we fill ourselves with so many other things, we've, we get busy and we're like, okay, so why can't we experience God? I can't feel him like I used to. It's no wonder because we've cluttered our lives with so many other things. It is hard to experience the presence of God. And so, what ha what's happening here is that Moses is pleading to God for his presence. I mean, who cares that they have the promised land at this point? If God is not with them, what does it matter? And so in this critical moment, Moses stands in the gap, reconciling God and his people. Because Moses knew that true freedom isn't doing whatever you want. True freedom isn't escaping Pharaoh or Egypt. True freedom isn't being in charge of your own life. That's not freedom. Moses knew, and this is something that we must also learn and know for ourselves, is that true freedom, and this is the, most, the biggest takeaway today, is that true freedom is living in God's presence. That's where everything changes. True freedom is when we experience God's presence. That unhindered presence of God is where we find ultimate peace and deliverance and freedom. And so the first thing that we need to learn is that we need to, number one, clear out that clutter. Clear, clear out the clutter in our lives. Because the reason why this is so important and is simply because that God's presence is difficult to experience 
when there are so many other competing things that are in our lives. Because hosting the presence of God means closing the door to other gods. So I'm going to jump back to verse 4, pick up where we left off um, earlier. Verse 4, it says, When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn, and no one put on any ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Tell the Israelites you are stiff-necked people. If I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you. Now take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. So now it's kind of interesting because of that word uh, ornament. Like God tells them to strip off their ornaments. Um, Why is that so important? It's basically ornaments is all the stuff that they had adorned themselves with, all the jewelry, all the fancy things that they brought with them. Um, And this is important because um, basically what was happening was that um, uh, all these ornaments that God was telling them to strip off, we have to actually ask, like, where did they get it? They didn't find it in the desert, right? They didn't walk around the desert and say, hey, look at this jewelry, look at this necklace, look at this ring. No, they brought it from Egypt. These are things that as they were leaving, as God was miraculously delivering them out of Egypt, they were grabbing onto things that had value, and they brought it with them. And as they were out in the desert, they were putting on these ornaments. I don't know who they were trying to impress out in the desert, but... You know, they, they, I mean, they were adorning themselves with all of these things. And here's what God is saying is that you need to strip yourself from all of those things. Because you see, even, when they, even though they had left Egypt, Egypt had not left them. So this is a turning point, actually, for Israel. And, and sure, they'll continue along the way over the years. But uh, this was a moment that they knew that they had to once and for all Get rid of Egypt so that they can make room for the presence of God. Now, see, this is a tricky thing is that all that stuff that we have, they're not all bad things. I mean, we have a lot of things um, because, uh, you know, all these things, they're not bad. They're actually, it's little, the tricky thing is that they often start as a gift from God. Right? God gives us so many things, all the things that we have. Um, you know, for our, for our family, uh, back in October, our house flooded. And um, so our, half of the house was completely destroyed by water. The water tank blew up. And then a few months later in March, the dishwasher flooded the other half of the house. So, like, isn't that nuts? Like, how does that even happen? We have two claims open with our insurance company. And they, obviously, they, you know, take us out. We're up in a hotel for a long time, in a condo for a long time. And finally, and what they did is they had to hire a moving company to get all our junk out into storage while they renovate. And finally, we moved back into our house yesterday, a couple of days ago, actually. Um, and so we're moving back. All our stuff is back in boxes, and we're unpacking it. And after being away from your stuff for about, like, seven, eight, nine months, you realize, do we even need all this stuff? Like, you're taking stuff out of your, all these boxes, and you're like, what even is this? This is trash. Why do we pack trash? Why do we haul this stuff around with us for all these years? And so now we have, obviously, some stuff we're putting into our pantries and our closets and whatnot, but we also have a pile of trash that we're going to just throw away. And we've been living with that stuff. And so, see, there's so many things in our lives, so much clutter in our lives. But the thing is, is that we don't even see it when we're living in it. That's the thing, is that we can feel the effects of it because we don't feel God's presence as deeply as we used to. But we don't know because we have so much clutter in our lives. And again, sometimes it starts out as great things, things that are a gift from God to us, things like careers, things like intelligence and money and relationships and all the possessions that we have, the things that we have. uh, These are all things that God gives to us. But see, they can easily become idols if they start replacing God. This means that we have to take a really honest inventory of our lives. We're filling our garages and storages and and calendars with so much stuff. How then do we find peace in the midst of all the clutter? 
And here's what some of us do, and this is what I'll do, is that, well, I'll just have to spend more time with God. I have to be just more intentional with God, and I'll try, but that often doesn't work because that's not the solution to the problem. The solution is that we have some stuff that we need to just get rid of. And sometimes we have to think through, what is that? What's preventing us from getting closer to God? Um, I remember um, this was maybe about like 10 years ago. I was, um, uh, I was really getting into like video games. I had like a PlayStation. And uh, for me, that was my thing. Like, you know, every night I would play uh, until like 10 p.m. And then like 11 p.m. And then 12 midnight. And then past midnight. I'm like, what in the world am I doing with my life, right? This is horrible. So I had to get rid of all of that stuff. Like this, this is something that I had to physically do. And just literally just stopped all of that. And really, there are so many different things, whether it's a PlayStation, whether it's this or that, whatever it is, we have to really think about, okay, what are the things that I need to get rid of in my life? Or how do we reprioritize our lives? Because some of these things are important things, because like things like family, they'll take up a lot of your time, and you can't just get rid of them, right? <laughs> and someone's like, oh, maybe. It's a question. Um, well, I'm sending one to college, so I guess that's kind of it. Um, but and we really have to think about, okay, how do we reprioritize our lives So that, sure, there are things that we need to prune, but there's things that we just need to reorder so that we can have God more front and center in our lives so that we can experience his presence. Uh, Which leads us to the second thing, um, and this happens because, uh, you know, we're going to blow it. We always blow it. I blow it all the time. Number two is that God always gives us a way back to his presence. And I think sometimes uh, for us, we're, we just feel like whenever we make a mistake, it's just final, it's done. We're, we're, we can't get out of our guilt and shame of what we had done. But here's the thing about God is that he always gives us a way back to his presence. Um, and I love that about God. Um, I love that no matter how badly we blow it, he always makes room for us to come back. Um, Right now, it's actually sound, it sounds like, as we're reading this passage, it sounds like that God had given up on Israel. But as we're reading this entire chapter a little bit more carefully, we see that God, who is angry, who, who seems like he's about to abort this whole mission with the people of Israel, he doesn't. In fact, he does the exact opposite. Instead of leaving them, he actually lingers. He stalls. And it's not because he's indecisive, but it's because God hasn't given up on his people yet. This may be the most gracious thing he's done uh, to to the people at that moment. Um, In fact, verse 7, it tells us as we continue, it says, Now Moses Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Now, notice it's not even in the camp of Israel, but now the presence of God to physically show that God is that had to be moved outside of the camp of Israel. But the cool thing is that God had not left. He did not disappear. So he's still in their peripheries, right? And they're like, okay, God is here. We really messed up. We need to figure something out. And so uh, Moses, he makes a, a tent of meeting um, uh, because at this point he knows that Israel is not worthy to really have God's presence in their midst. God is furious, but he still lingers. And so Moses, he goes to the tent of meeting and he says, verse 12, he says, you have been telling me, leave these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. And the Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Um, I'm going to pause here for just a moment, because now... It might sound like, oh, okay, they fi- Moses fixed everything. Things are looking good. But if, here's the thing about the English language that we can't really see here um, is that the word you, my presence will go with you, I will give you rest, is actually in the singular. And so basically what God is saying is that my presence will go with you, Moses, and I will give you 
rest, Moses. But Moses won't accept this. For most, most people, they'd be like, okay, you know what? That's good enough for me. Like, at least I'm covered. Um, but Moses, this is not enough for him. Because for Moses, it has to include the entire nation. We continue in this passage. It says, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all of the people on the face of the earth? And so here's what Moses does. He pursues God on behalf of the people of Israel. It's so different than the Moses of, uh, of early on, Moses chapter 3, uh, or in Exodus chapter 3 and 4, where God is calling Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. And remember all the excuses? Um, you, you might not know this, but he was making so many excuses, one excuse after another, when God was saying, I'm calling you, Moses, to get my people out of Egypt. I've heard their cries, and I need a leader to go in there. And Moses is making one excuse after another, saying, you know what, God, no, 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 what if they don't listen to me? You can't, you can't ask me I'm not that person right what if I'm not I'm not eloquent enough I don't have the words I don't have the right words to convince Pharaoh let alone the your even your people like I don't think I have the eloquency to be able to do that like who am I no I'm a nobody I'm a shepherd now all of my life all of that stuff like I'm not who I used to be when I was at Pharaoh's palace I'm a nobody now nobody knows me Right? And some of you might resonate with that. Like, how can God call me to do something um, that he wants me to like, And I say this to myself all the time, uh, especially earlier on when I was getting into ministry. I was like, God, I was, so, I was so resonated with Moses. I was like, God, I'm a nobody. How do I, how do, I do this? Like, have you, God, have you tried Googling me? Like, honestly, like, okay, honestly, here. Has anyone Googled themselves? Come on, let's be honest. All right, thank you for your honesty, the two people over there. Um, the rest of you are liars. Um, just kidding. Uh, but here, I don't Google myself often, maybe just twice a week. But um, <laughs> when I Google myself, you know what I found? I was overshadowed by this musician, this YouTube phenom named David Choi, who happened actually to be from the same city in Southern California that I was in. And so whenever I called somebody or, you know, talked to somebody and said, I'm David Choi, like, oh, are you the David? No, I'm not that David Choi. Sorry. Sorry to disappoint you. Um, and so you're, I'm going through my the list of names of David Choi's on Google. And after, like, several pages of this, you know, uh, superstar musician David Choi, um, then you get to the rest of the David Choi's who are all, because they're Korean, they're doctors and lawyers, Right? David Choi, MD. David Choi, JD. That's not me, right? So I'm like, oh my gosh, nope, page four, page five, page six. I'm going to keep going, right? I'm like, okay, when is it going to get to me, right? And surely, I'm like, okay, after the list of doctors and lawyers, there's going to be David Choi, the pastor, right? No, it's David Choi, the taco truck guy. <laughs> the taco truck guy made it before me, right? I, I appeared on page 10, Page 10, that's like, you're not, you didn't even get drafted, all right? Um, and so it's like, I'm like, God, you don't, like, do you know who you're asking? Ask the other David Choi. At least he can sing people to you or something. Like, I don't know what I can do. Um, but in some, honestly, like, some of us might feel like that. We might feel like, you know what, I'm a nobody. Like, I'm not worthy uh, to pursue God as boldly as Moses did. Um, and I feel underqualified. And I made plenty of mistakes along my life that I just don't feel like I can make my way back truly into God's presence and not feel guilty in God's presence. Because sometimes that happens, doesn't it? Like when we get into God's presence, we're like, oh man, this is so great. But you feel so small and so guilty. And it's actually painful being in God's presence sometimes because of what the enemy is whispering into your ears. Saying, you don't deserve this. You don't belong here. You don't deserve the transformation or the grace that they're talking about on the stage. That's not for you because remember what you did? Remember who you are? You're nobody. You've done this. Like, you don't deserve it. But here's the thing with God is that he will always make a way, always make a way for us to come back to him. And that's because number three, and our final thing here is today is that God's presence is ultimately predicated on who he is not what we have done. It's really all because of him and not because of us. 
It has nothing to do with what we have done. It has everything to do with who he is. See, even when we are, um, when we are uh, uh, drive, ourse- drive ourselves so far away from God and, and remove us so far from the presence of God, and we feel like there's no way that God will ever take me back, his presence, we have to remember, is ultimately predicated on who he is. It doesn't matter what the enemy is whispering in your ear. It doesn't matter what someone else said about you. It doesn't matter what you're thinking about yourself. The only thing that matters is that God wants you. This is great news, isn't it? Um, God's presence is available to us, not because we wanted it, but because he wanted it. We have to see um, that at the end of this uh, chapter, when uh, Moses asks, um, we see a glimpse of this heart of God. When Moses asks to see God's presence, and God tells, uh, this is what he says to Moses, uh, verse 21. He says, then the Lord said, there is a place near me, near me where you may t- stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back. But my face must not, must not be seen. Um, can you believe that? Like seeing the physical presence of God, like seeing God moving right before your eyes is a pretty incredible thing. But you know, that actually pales in comparison to what God would do 1,500 years later or so, where the presence of God arrives in the person of Jesus in the flesh. Where the presence of God is tangible and visible and audible in the person of Jesus. Something that Moses, even Moses couldn't experience or see. But Jesus here, is representing the presence of God, walks our earth and for the first time, humanity has an understanding of what true grace is, what true love is. You know, he did something on the cross that no man could ever do, not even Moses. Jesus gave us access to the presence of God to all people once and for all. Because there's a veil in the temple that separated man and God. A veil that was like 60 feet tall and 40 feet wide and like four inches thick. I mean, that, was, that wasn't a veil. That was a brick wall. And yet, when Jesus died on the cross, Scripture tells us that that veil tore in half. Allowing us to access the presence of God. Uh, the presence of God coming out of that room, out of the Holy of Holies, into the midst of the people. And so that we can have direct access and conversations and a relationship with Jesus that no one else could have given us except for Jesus. And that's what the presence of God does. It sets us free. All of that was initiated by God. Not really because we asked for it, but out of the abundance of God's grace, he gave us a gift that, that we didn't even know we needed. And we have that very gift today. So freedom is living in the presence of God. Freedom is found when we are walking with Jesus because Jesus tore that veil. Because Jesus gave us access to God, to the presence of God. We can enter that throne room. We're back in the Old Testament. When someone entered into that throne room, into the Holy of Holies, they would be struck dead right on the spot. Because the presence of God was so overwhelming. And it was so pure and so holy that anyone that had any blemish that would walk into this place would just collapse and die because it was just, they were just filled with so much all of the presence of God. And now because of Jesus, we have complete access. And it's kind of mind-blowing. What we'll do is that instead of accessing that, we'll try to fill our lives with so many things and take that for granted at times. But see, I think what God is wanting to remind us today is that I'm available to you. 
I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know what's clinging to the back of you that's preventing you from growth, from really living the life that God had intended for you. But we can be free from that because of who Jesus is. And I know that we're always, we've, we're always thinking about freedom. How can we be free from this? How can we experience a fuller life? See, it's not really even that. That's actually the byproduct. The actual thing that we ought to be pursuing is God's presence. Everything else, everything else comes in order when we are able to fully access and be in the presence of God. And I want that for you today. And I know God wants to give that to us today. And I don't know where we are uh, today. Maybe some of us are closer to God than we've ever been. Maybe some of us are finding ourselves drifting and we don't even know that we've been drifting. But we know now that I had been drifting and something has to change. And maybe for some of us, we're just far, far, far away from God. And even still, every single one of us has an opportunity to draw nearer to God. And in the end, experience the freedom that he promises us. And I want that for us. God, we look to you here this morning. Because there is no one like you. There is no one that can do the things that you've done. There is no one that can truly answer the questions in our lives, the struggles in our lives, God. The pain that we're experiencing, God, no one else, God, can really address all of that and answer all of that but you. And so, God, as we sit here in your presence, God. Remind us that yes, you are a powerful God. Yes, you are a just God. But you are also a gracious and loving God. Always making a way for us to come back to you. My hope and prayer for us today, God, is that no matter where we are in our faith journey, that we will have taken another step closer to you. That we will have left some of the things that have been keeping us from coming to you further behind because we're taking a step closer to you and I pray that for my friends here to this, this morning let them know that you that they are wanted by you that you desire them so we thank you for just pouring your love and grace out on us and it's in your mighty name we pray